Christ, suffering at the hands of Rome, because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be hosting for the next two hours. First, we'll begin where we left off last time in this uh, in most magnificent Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. And then we will, we will read for an hour and then uh, have discussion afterwards. My pleasure to be here this evening. My apologies for last week. Now, again, we left off on page 231 for those who are following along in the reading. This work is, uh, I'm reading from the version on the uh, Toronto, the University of Toronto archives. And I'll back up, as is my custom, a half a page or so for continuity purposes. And we'll begin reading the first full paragraph on page 230. The author, Henry Grattan Guinness, says, On December 10th in the same year, 1520, Martin Luther called together the professors and students in the town of Wittenberg and publicly burned the papal bull. Now remember, uh, Martin Luther had written his 95 theses and tacked it on the Wittenberg church door. It was read by all, the word went out that Martin Luther, the, the learned professor at the Wittenberg University, had condemned the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture and had condemned the practice, the Antichrist practice of simony, whereby the papacy sold indulgences or the forgiveness of sins for money. Now, the Pope responds by issuing a bull of excommunication and eternal damnation to Martin Luther for daring to call the Pope the Antichrist. But as with all true Bible believers, those who understand the prophecies in the Bible regarding Antichrist and know anything about the history of the papacy, it's, well, it's inarguable. There's no other candidate for the title Antichrist in the Pope of Rome. And so, on the 10th of December of 1520, Martin Luther called together the professors and students of the town of Wittenberg and publicly burned the papal bull. Along with it, he burned the canon law, the decretals, the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, the clementines, and the extravagance of the popes. In other words, a huge library of books, books that, as a Roman Catholic monk, Martin Luther had been assigned to study. 
okay? He burned the whole lot because he believed all those writings were false, that the papacy was not the vicar of Christ or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, but he was the very Antichrist. So Martin Luther signed his death warrant by calling the Pope the Antichrist, received the bull of excommunication from the Pope in response, and continued by burning all the Roman Catholic writings, all the Roman Catholic canon law. That's the entire body of law of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the author continues, he says, the die was now cast. Luther had declared war against the Roman pontiff. He had, quote, boldly denominated him, that is the Pope, the man of sin, and exhorted all Christian princes, in other words, all the governments of Europe at that time, he exhorted all Christian princes to shake off his usurpations. That is, to shake off the Pope's usurpations. At that time, all the princes of Europe served the papacy by means of canon law. And if they defied the papacy, then they were excommunicated and they were overthrown and a new king was put in place. But Martin Luther openly commands all the governments of Europe to throw off the Pope's authority and then rule at the behest of the people. Don't we need that today? In this manner was the Reformation inaugurated. This is how the Protestant Reformation began. A declaration of war against the papacy, burning the papal bull, burning the Roman Catholic canon law, and commanding all civil rulers to disobey the Pope and listen to Christ and his people. Martin Luther was beginning to understand that the temple of the Holy Spirit was each and every believer, and that the papacy was a usurper of that rightful throne. Now, continuing, he says, in order to justify his actions, Martin Luther selected 30 articles from the Code of Papal Laws, 30 articles from the Code of Canon Law, as illustrating the contents of the books he had consumed in fire. These he printed with pointed remarks, calling on the people to use their own judgment with reference to them. He summed up by saying that on comparing the different parts of the Roman Catholic canon law, its language simply amounts to this, quote, that the Pope is God on earth above all that is earthly, temporal or spiritual, that all things belong to the Pope, and that no one must venture to say to the Pope, what doest thou, unquote. Here, says Henry Grattan Guinness, giving a live lecture, remember, he's holding up another book. Here is an old black letter copy of Martin Luther's commentary on the Epistle of Galatians. Under the expression in the second verse, quote, the churches of Galatia, he says, wheresoever the substance of the holy sacraments remaineth, there is the holy church. Although Antichrist there reigns, who, as the scripture witnesseth, sitteth not in a stable of fiends, nor in a swine sty, or in a company of infidels, but in the highest and holiest place of all, namely, in the temple of God, unquote. Now here I must make some comments. First of all, you'll notice that Martin Luther, in this writing, in his commentary on the, the epistle of Galatians, still being a newly reformed Roman Catholic, still makes reference to the holy sacraments, okay? In the Roman Catholic Church, there are seven the Eucharist being one, matrimony, uh, extreme unction, holy orders, baptism, 
and one escapes me at the moment, but these are all considered holy sacraments. They are unique to the Roman Catholic Church. They are not practiced in the Bible-believing churches. Okay, Christ gave two ordinances, baptism <coughs> and, and uh, a confession. But look, Mark, we have before I'm accused of being too hard on Martin Luther. We have to remember that Martin Luther is was in the process of translating the scriptures from Latin into German, and for the first time reading the scriptures in his own language. And he came to the realization that the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy, in particular, was the Antichrist of Scripture. Now, it took a period of time for him to completely reform his understanding. And so we give a pass to Martin Luther here in this case, and we understand that before he died, he had renounced the sacraments, and especially the Eucharist. Now he says, quote, Wheresoever the substance of the holy sacraments remaineth, there is the holy church, although... Antichrist there reigns, who, as the Scripture witnesseth, sitteth not in a stable of fiends or in a swine sty, in other words, a pig sty, or in a company of infidels, but in the highest and holiest place of all, namely in the temple of God. Unquote. So he's again clearly calling the papacy the Antichrist of Scripture, the fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John regarding the little horn with a mouth that speaks and who sits in the temple of God claiming himself to be God. We have Paul's prophecies and also John the Revelator's prophecies which point to no one else but the papacy. Those prophecies cannot apply to any other man, any other institution in world history than the papacy. Now, continuing with the writing, the author says, again, he exclaims, quote, is not this to sit in the temple of God to profess himself to be ruler in the whole church? What is the temple of God? Is it stones and wood? Did Paul did not Paul say the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are to sit? What is it but to reign, to teach, and to judge? Who from the beginning of the church has dared to call himself master of the whole church, but the Pope alone? Now I'm commenting here. You can see Martin Luther systematically proving his claim that the papacy and no one but the papacy can fulfill all the prophecies of Scripture regarding the Antichrist. Now, again, I reiterate to the listeners, we can make no mistake by reading the prophecies. We can make no mistake about who the Messiah is. Those who say that Jesus, after reading the scriptures, that Jesus was not the Messiah are clearly being intellectually dishonest with themselves. Now, again, I ask the listeners, if God made it so obvious who the Christ was, who our Messiah was, why would he then turn and be ambiguous about who his counterfeit is. If Christ loved us so much to die for us, to save us from our sin, to save us from this Antichrist power, why would he, he then play games with us as to the real identity of the Antichrist? And clearly, if you study this book and the writings of the Protestant Reformers, you realize that God was just as specific about who the Antichrist is at, than who Jesus Christ was. God does not deal treacherously with his people. 
He does not save us and then trick us and lead us into temptation or derision or confusion or any other such thing regarding the Antichrist. Christ logically wants us to know who he is, and he likewise wishes us to know who the Antichrist is. And if you study this, you'll see that the prophecies of the Bible leave no room for doubt. And it's equally likewise to, uh, to say that those who deny that the papacy is the fulfillment of every Bible prophecy regarding Antichrist are being intellectually dishonest with themselves. It's just that simple. Again, he says, is not this to sit in the temple of God to profess himself to be ruler in the whole church? What is the temple of God? Is it stone and wood? Did not Paul say the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are? To sit, what is it but to reign, to teach, and to judge? Who, who else from the beginning of the church has dared to call himself master of the whole church but the Pope alone? None of the saints, none of the heretics have ever uttered so horrible a word of pride, unquote. So you can see Martin Luther has left no other option for Antichrist but the papacy. Now, is that what's being taught in your churches today? That you can be absolutely scripturally, prophetically, historically, and every other way irrefutably convinced that the papacy is the Antichrist, and there is virtually no other candidate in history. No other candidate could ever fulfill all of these prophecies but the papacy. It's, it's a lead pipe cinch, if you'll pardon the expression. It's a done deal. This is what the earliest Christians believed, that whatever Roman power replaced the pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars, that, and only that, would be the Antichrist of Scripture. On that issue alone, we can be unswervingly convinced that the papacy is the Antichrist, but Martin Luther gives us all these other signs. And listen, We're only talking about Martin Luther now. We're going to talk about what all the reformers believed. Their writings are still available. And we need not be deceived any longer about the identity of Antichrist and how to recognize it in the world. He continues. Elsewhere, again, he says that when Daniel, quote, saw the terrible wild beast, which had ten horns, which by the consent of all is the Roman Empire, he also beheld another small horn come up in the midst of them. This is the papal power which rose up in the middle of the Roman Empire, unquote. So here you see, Martin Luther believed just like the early Christians did, that whatever power, whatever Roman power, replaced the pagan Roman Caesars, that would be the Antichrist. Martin Luther says this is the papal power. It can be no one else. No one else rose to power after the fall of Rome and the fall of the Caesars. Now, continuing, he says, Thus did Martin Luther interpret prophecy. And under the influence of these interpretations of the prophetic teachings of Daniel, Paul, and John, sprang up and advanced the glorious Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. 
Do you know what I just read? I just read that the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation was the unanimous, unswerving belief that the papacy and only the papacy could be the Antichrist of Scripture. Let me read it again, and you judge for yourself whether I've done violence to Henry Grattan Guinness's writing. Listen again to what he said. Thus did Martin Luther interpret the prophecy. And under the influence of these interpretations of the prophetic teachings of Daniel, Paul, and John, sprang up and advanced the glorious Reformation of the 16th century. That's how all the Protestant reformers interpreted those prophecies. They were unanimous in their interpretation. It could be none else but the papacy. Now, one of the witnesses of Luther's disputations at Leipzig in the year 1519 was Philip Melanchthon, the learned... Now, we've already talked about Martin Luther. We're going to move on to the other Protestant reformers, one right after another. Now we're going to talk about a cohort of a fellow professor at Wittenberg of Martin Luther's named Philip Melanchthon, the learned professor of Greek at Wittenberg. Melanchthon was a man of wonderful ability and application. The treatment of the most difficult subjects became simple in his hands. He was one of the greatest theologians of his age and composed the celebrated Confession of Oxford in 1530, the foundation of the Reformed German faith. Okay, Philip Melanchthon, his writings are still extant. You can Google and read his writings. He was the one who authored the celebrated Protestant Confessions of Oxford in 1530, and that became the foundation of the Reformed German faith, the Protestant German faith. As this, continue with the reading, he says, as this confession was intended to be publicly read to the hostile Roman Catholic Emperor Charles V, in the presence of princes and ecclesiastical dignitaries, that is, Roman Catholic princes and ecclesiastical dignitaries, Philip Melanchthon toned it down as far as possible, avoiding all judgments of the Roman Catholic Church, which could cause offense. Luther complained of this omission, quote, Satan sees clearly, he said, that our uh, rather, that your apology has passed lightly over the articles of purgatory, the worship of saints, and above all, of the Pope and of Antichrist, unquote. So this mild-mannered, very cautious, very circumspect, and one might infer a bit self-preserving, Philip Melanchthon wrote the Articles of Confession of Oxford and then wrote or rather read those confessions to the Roman Catholic prince Charles V and hopefully do it in such a way that wouldn't, you know, end up with him losing his head over the thing. But it nonetheless is a Protestant confession proclaiming the papacy as Antichrist. Now, Charles V served the Pope. Did he? If he did not serve the Pope, he would have either lost his head or he would have lost his crown. So you can see that it took a great deal, almost unimaginable strength of will for these Protestant reformers to stand up to the most powerful governments of Europe, this being Charles V of Germany could well and most likely end with your losing your head. Now, Melanchthon toned it down a bit, and Martin Luther immediately protests. If you're going to tell the Protestant story, you've got to tell it clean. The papacy is the Antichrist. We cannot, we cannot tread softly on this issue, is basically what Martin Luther is saying. We don't want to confuse anybody. We want everybody to know where we stand, and we stand upon the very foundation that the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture, the little horn 
the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Now, Martin Luther was upset with Philip Melanchthon, his cohort, his co-professor at the College of Wittenberg. Now, continuing, he says, Melanchthon lacked the bold spirit of Martin Luther, but he shared most of his sentiments. He was clear in his convictions that Rome is the Babylon of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, and the Pope is the man of sin. In his disputation on marriage, referring to the first epistle to Timothy, he says, quote, since it is most certain that the pontiffs and the monks have forbidden marriage, it is most manifest and without any doubt true that the Roman pontiff, with his whole order and kingdom, is the very Antichrist. He adds, quote, Likewise, in Second Thessalonians 2, Paul clearly says, that the man of sin shall rule in the church, exalting himself against the worship of God, etc. But it is manifest. In other words, it is clearly seen, inarguably evident, that the popes do rule in the church and under the title of the church in defending idols. Wherefore, I affirm that no heresy hath arisen nor indeed shall be, with which these descriptions of Paul can be more truly and certainly accorded and agree than to this papal kingdom, unquote. So there you have it from Melanchthon, who finally tightens up his, his girdle and tells the truth in plain language that everybody could understand. He reiterates in his own language what Martin Luther says. Listen again to what he says. He is saying in this quote, he is saying there is no other candidate for the fulfillment of the prophecies of Antichrist than the papacy. Listen again carefully to what he says and see for yourself that I have done no violence to what he said. Quote, Wherefore, I affirm that no heresy hath arisen in the past, nor indeed shall be in the future, with which these descriptions of Paul can more truly and certainly accord and agree than to this papal kingdom, unquote. So Melanchthon, not as, not as direct as Tom Press, clearly said, there's no heresy in the past. There's no heresy in the future that could possibly arise that could more fully agree with the scriptures than this papal kingdom, the Holy Roman Empire under the popes. So Melanchthon makes his point. It's the same point that Martin Luther makes. It's the same point that all believers back to apostolic times made that the papacy is the Antichrist, no one in history has ever even begun to fulfill those prophecies. And I dare say, as perfectly as God has described the papacy in these prophecies, there's not a hope in Hades that there'll be a future Antichrist. We've got our Antichrist. Don't look for another. That's, in essence what they all said. Now we'll continue. He further adds in the same disputation in Article 25, quote, the prophet Daniel also attributes these two things to Antichrist, viz, that he shall place an idol in the temple and honor it with gold and silver, and that he shall not honor women, that both these things belong to the Roman pontiff, who does not clearly see. The idols are clearly the impious mass. Here, the impious mass. Melanchthon gets it. The mass is an idol, according to Melanchthon. He says the idols are clearly the impious mass, the worship of saints, 
and the statues which are exhibited in gold and silver that they may be worshipped, unquote. The Protestant Reformation begun in Switzerland by Zwingli. Now we're going on to a third Protestant reformer, Zwingli of Switzerland. The Reformation begun in Switzerland by Zwingli, who was previously canon and priest of Zurich, and carried on by Ecolampadius, Bullinger, and others, produced the Helvetic Confession. Here's another Protestant confession written by Reformed Roman Catholics proclaiming the papacy to be the Antichrist of Scripture. The Helvetic Confession drawn up at Basel by Reformed Swiss theologians in 1536. This confession, after being accepted and signed by the Reformed cantons and towns, was sent to the Lutheran divines assembled at Smalkald in 1537. In both the Helvetic and the Smalkald confessions, the papacy is condemned as the predicted anti-Christian power. Did you hear that? All of the Protestant confessions of faith those written confessions of faith that became the law of those Reformed churches. This is what you must believe if you're going to belong to the body of Christ. You must believe that the papacy is the Antichrist. These Protestant confessions are still extant. You can Google the titles and read them for yourselves. Now, by now, you have to be asking yourself, why are not these confessions of faith read in the Protestant churches today? Because this is post-modern times. This is post-Vatican Council II times when after a couple generations of futurism being taught in the churches that Antichrist has not yet come in the world and he will not come until seven or three and a half years before Christ returns, then we all must reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, put away the Protestant Reformation, regard it as, a, as an unfortunate error and an assault upon the legitimate throne of Christ on the earth, and then we must make reparations to the pontiff by conquering the rest of the world and bringing them into forcible submission to the papacy. That's the role the United States plays today. Post-Vatican Council II, this United States, once Protestant, has now become Roman Catholic and is shedding the blood of ignorant and apostate Protestants fighting papal proxy wars to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope and to restore him to global power, the same power that he wielded in the Holy Roman Empire that was once nearly destroyed. A mortal wound had been inflicted at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Are you beginning to see more clearly how apostate the churches are today? They have taught us a lie. They have taught us to believe and to teach a lie, a lie called Futurism, devised by the Jesuits at the Council of Trent and developed further afterwards, has been become orthodox teaching of all the churches today. And we must, if we truly believe that Jesus is the Christ, then we must return to the Protestant Reformation and Protestant teachings. Do you understand when I say now that if you do not know who the Antichrist is, if you have to hesitate even long enough to take a breath to answer, it is the papacy, then you cannot legitimately call yourself a Protestant. And if you believe in a future Antichrist, you cannot be a Protestant. You may call yourself a Protestant, 
but not with a clear conscience. It's a hideous reality that we all must face. We have departed from the truth, and we have believed a lie. And we owe the papacy nothing but the condemnation given to it by the Protestant reformers. We owe no duty to the papacy to restore to him that which God took from him through the Protestant Reformation. The new world order is simply the old world order restored on a global scale. And who is accomplishing this feat for the papacy? Those who once called themselves Protestants, who have withdrawn their support for Protestantism, have essentially called Martin Luther, Zwingli, and all the Protestant reformers apostates, who have by their actions, by their beliefs, have rendered all the martyrs of Jesus over the last 2,000 years those who died in vain. Can you still remain a futurist? Can you still afford to be lazy or apathetic and not continue to study what the Protestant Reformation was all about? Can you continue to support with your efforts, with your charities, with your presence, and with your tithe money in an ecumenical, evangelical belly church? Or is your soul at stake? We're going to continue this lecture of Henry Grattan Guinness. He's moving on to the Bohemian Confessions now. What did the Bohemians believe? The same great doctrine is taught in the valuable Bohemian Confession of 1573, which was composed of four confessions of more ancient date. That's right. The Bohemians go all the way back to John Huss, one of the earliest Protestant reformers. Then we have John Calvin, that mighty theologian and reformer, whose works are published in 50 volumes, uttered upon this subject no uncertain sound. In his letter to the Emperor Charles V on the necessity of reforming the church, he wrote as follows, quote, now he's talking about reforming the Roman Catholic Church. The Protestant reformers all realized late in the Reformation that there is no reforming that church. It is prophesied to continue as it is until Christ returns, and it will be Christ who will destroy it. Still, we're at the earliest times in the Protestant Reformation, and they want to reform this church, and so... And so John Calvin writes a letter to Roman Catholic Emperor Charles V calling for reform in the church. He says in his letter to the Emperor Charles V on the necessity of reforming the church, he wrote as follows, quote, The arrogance of Antichrist of which Paul speaks is that he, that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. For where is the incomparable majesty of God after mortal man has been exalted to such a height that his laws take precedence of God's eternal decrees? I omit that the apostle describes the prohibitions of meats and of marriage as doctrines of devils. That is surely bad enough. But the crowning impiety is to set man in a higher rank than God. If they deny the truth of my statement, I appeal to fact, unquote. This is John Calvin speaking. He goes on to say, quote, What are those two laws of celibacy and auricular confession, but dire murderers of souls, unquote. 
At the conclusion of his letter to the emperor, he says, quote, I deny that see, that is the holy see, the papal see, the papal government, I deny that see to be apostolical, wherein naught is seen but a shocking apostasy. I deny him to be the vicar of Christ, who in furiously persecuting the gospel demonstrates by his conduct that he is antichrist. I deny him to be the successor of Peter, who is doing his utmost to demolish every edifice that Peter ever built. And I deny him to be the head of the church, who by his tyranny lacerates and dismembers the church after disavering her from Christ, her true and only head, unquote. So is John Calvin convinced that the papacy is the Antichrist of Daniel, Paul, and John? Unequivocally, unrepentingly. This is Protestantism, ladies and gentlemen. You've never heard it your whole life, nor have I until I began my research into Protestantism. We must retreat from ecumenism, the unification of the Protestant faiths back to the Roman Catholic Church. We must stop fighting these papal proxy wars because to fight for the benefit of the Pope is to make war, open war against the Lamb of Almighty God. To fight and die, to indebt this nation beyond its ability to repay in fighting papal proxy wars all over the world to help conquer the world for the papacy and restore him to his original antichrist power at the turn of the first millennium is to make aggressive, active, and constant war against the Christ that we profess. We must repudiate the ecumenical movement, and Vatican Council too. We must repent of any notion of restoring the papacy to his original power and control in this world. Or we are making war against our own Messiah, the one who died for us, the one who we profess to believe in. We need to put him the head of the church and we need, to con- we need to condemn in the strongest possible terms this counterfeit in Rome. Continue with the reading, he says, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin again defends the view that the Roman pontiff is Antichrist. Quote, to some he says, we seem slanderous and petulant when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who think so perceive not that they are bringing a charge of intemperance against Paul, after whom we speak, nay, in whose very words we speak. Paul says that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God. Hence we infer that his tyranny is more over souls than bodies. Excuse me, a tyranny set up in opposition to the spiritual kingdom of God. When he adds that in his own time the mystery of iniquity, which was afterwards to be openly manifested, had already begun to work in secret, we thereby understand this calamity was neither to be introduced by one man nor to terminate in one man. So what does futurism teach? That the Antichrist is one man. But we can clearly infer by what Paul said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So it's going to be again in Paul's time, and it's going to continue throughout the Christian age until Christ returns. There's no futurism in that. It's all historicism. It's all that every Bible-believing Christian, every martyr of Jesus, every Protestant reformer, 
from the times of the apostles all the way to Christ's return, believe. Can we, can we even deceive ourselves to continue to embrace futurism? That the Antichrist is not fulfilled in prophecy, but that one man at the end of time, just before Christ's return, will be the Antichrist of Scripture? It's delusion. Strong delusion. It's a lie. And virtually the entire Christian world believes it. He continues, moreover, when the mark by which he distinguishes Antichrist is that he would rob God of his honor and take it to himself, he gives the leading feature which ought to follow in searching, which we ought to follow in searching out Antichrist especially when pride of this description proceeds to the open devastation of the church. What, what, did, what, what did he just say? He said the leading characteristic of this Antichrist power would be that he would rob God of his honor and place it upon himself. That is precisely what the papacy and only the papacy has done. <clears throat> Further, he says, seeing then it is certain that the Roman pontiff has impudently transferred to himself the most peculiar properties of God and Christ, there cannot be a doubt that he is the leader and standard bearer of an impious and abominable kingdom, unquote. Calvin doesn't mince any words here. There's no equivocation. There's no room for debate. John Calvin is openly, unswervingly, condemning the papacy as the fulfillment, the only possible candidate for the Antichrist of Scripture and his kingdom, which rules over the kings of the earth. Name me one other antichrist, one other false antichrist. You've heard of them. Innumerable host of candidates for antichrist when there's only one legitimate candidate. Which one of those false candidates has ever dared to call himself the vicar of Christ or the replacement of Christ on earth. Take now the testimony of William Tyndale, another Protestant reformer. Here are several volumes. It's, this is Henry Grant and Guinness. He must have brought his entire library to this lecture. Here are several volumes containing the doctrines and treatises of that famous minister, reformer, and martyr, who first translated the New Testament from Greek into English. See how plainly this learned and honest man spoke out on the anti-Christian character of the papacy. Quote, Antichrist, he says, in another manner, hath set forth his disciples, those false anointed of which Christ warns us before, that they should come and show miracles and wonders, even to bring the very elect out of the way if it was possible. A bishop must be faultless, the husband of one wife. Nay, saith the Pope, the husband of no wife, but the holder of as many women as he wishes. What saith the Pope? I command to read the gospel in Latin, the dead language of Latin that no one can understand, right? It is barely as good to preach to swine as to men if they if you preach if you preach it in a tongue they understand not. You clearly see that the papacy has always commanded that the scriptures be preached in the dead language of Latin that the people that don't understand 
that only the priests understand and that those who sat in the Roman Catholic churches listening to these Latin sermons didn't understand a word the priest was saying. It was intended that they should never understand a word that the priest was saying. And for all that, you'd just as well be reading the scriptures to swine. if you preach the gospel in a language that the people do not understand. Well, saith the Pope, if they will not be ruled, cite them to appear and pose them sharply what they hold of the Pope's power, of his pardons, his bulls, and of purgatory, of ceremonies and confessions. If they miss in any point, make heretics of them and burn them. Do you hear what that says? The papacy says, if the people will not be ruled by the Pope, charge them to appear before the papacy and pose to them sharply questions and ask them what they think of the Pope's power and of his power to pardon sins. Ask them what they think about his papal bulls, his thunders, Ask them what they think of purgatory. Ask them what they think of the ceremonies and the pomp and the phony circumstances of the Roman Catholic Church. Ask them what they think of the confessions to the priests. And if they miss the correct answer on any of these points, label them heretics and burn them. That is the history of the papacy from beginning to end. He says further, the emperors and kings are no other nowadays but even hangmen unto the popes and the bishops to kill whomsoever they condemn without any more ado, just as Pilate was unto the scribes and the Pharisees and the high bishops to hang Christ. That was the old world order. I want to read it again so that you may recognize what it is. At the time of the old world order, when the Pope was in the pinnacle of his power, when he was literally the king of kings and lord of lords, what role did the emperors and the kings and the potentates of that old world order, what role did they play in relationship to the Pope of Rome? Listen again. The emperors and kings are no other nowadays but even hangmen unto the popes and the bishops to kill whomsoever they condemn without any more ado, just as Pilate was to the scribes and the Pharisees and the high bishops to hang Christ. So the civil governments of the world, the kings, the princes, the queens, the potentates, were charged by the papacy to serve as the hangman of all of those who incorrectly answered these questions about the Pope's power. And do you know that defines all of history? History that is simply absent from our grade school, high school, and post-high school uh, education libraries. There's no description of the old world order that would make any sense to those who are now discovering what the new world order is. You see, they blinded us simply by hiding from us what the old world order was. The Pope ruled supreme. There was no challenge to the Pope. The whole of Europe was Roman Catholic by force. It was imposed upon the people by all the kings, all the princes, all the potentates who ruled Europe under the authority of the papacy. And they literally served as the crusaders and the inquisitors of the Pope and terrorized God's people. Anybody who lifted a pen, anybody who lifted the voice against the papacy 
was summarily destroyed by his own government. Again, I will reiterate, the new world order is the old world order restored. And how could this be? Simply because the Christian world has exonerated the papacy and now believes in a future Antichrist. And because of that lie, because it is so widely believed as to become the orthodox teaching of all so-called Christian churches, Rome can now do in these days, our days, what he did to God's people in the old world order. And that's why my program is called Inquisition Update. Rome has plans to silence any and all opposition, anyone who would lift a pen or lift his voice to declare and to prove, just as all the Protestant reformers did, that there is no candidate for the Antichrist, either in history or in the future, but the papacy. Anyone who believes in Christ and likewise denounces Antichrist will be target number one of this new world order, just as they were target number one in the old world order. He continues, What signifieth that the prelates are so bloody and clothed in red that they be ready every hour to suffer martyrdom for the testimony of God's word? Is that also not a false sign when no man dare for them once open his mouth to ask the question of God's word because they are ready to burn him? That's right. You could not approach a scarlet-clad cardinal and ask any of them a question about the gospel of Jesus Christ because if you asked a question, by asking that question, you identified yourself as a heretic Protestant, and they were ready to burn you at the stake without any more ado. Just by simply questioning the scriptures to a Roman Catholic prelate was like signing your own death warrant. So it was in the old world order, so it will be in the new world order. And if you're still attending an ecumenical evangelical belly church, you're going to see your pastors transition from just another sheep like you all to a priestly class. And you will no longer be welcome to question to the pastor, what saith the scriptures? You will simply be required to believe whatever that Protestant priest tells you to believe. You see the gospel being taken out of the churches. Why? Because they don't want anybody asking questions about the gospel. You wonder why the churches are lukewarm turning into social societies and charity institutions and the gospel is never even mentioned, let alone studied? You can thank the ecumenical movement. You can thank the World Council of Churches. You can thank the National Council of Churches. You can thank the U.S. government. You can thank the Jesuits that run the seminaries in this country. And you can thank... Rome for being what she is, the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17 that preaches another gospel and another Jesus. He continues, is not that shepherd's hook, the bishop's crozier, a false sign? Is not that white is not that white rocher that the bishops and the canons wear so like a nun and so effeminately a false sign? 
What other things are there? Sandals, gloves, miters, and all the whole pomp of their disguising than false signs in which Paul prophesied that they should come. And as Christ warned us to beware of wolves and lamb skins and bade us to look rather unto their fruits and deeds than to the wonder at their disguisings, run throughout all our holy religions and thou shalt find them likewise all clothed in falsehood, unquote. Is there any question in your mind what John Calvin believed? He even talked about their clothes, identify them as Antichrist. In his exposition of the famous passage about Antichrist in the first epistle of John, Tyndale says, quote, excuse me, I said John Calvin, we're talking about Tyndale, William Tyndale. Tyndale says, quote, Though the bishop of Rome and his sects give Christ these names, his rightful names, yet in that they rob him of the effect and take the signification of his names unto themselves and make of him but a hypocrite, as they themselves be, they be the right Antichrist and deny both the Father and the Son. For they deny the witness that the Father bore unto the Son and deprive the Son of all the power and glory that his Father gave him. For whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. For no man knoweth the Father but the Son, and to whom the Son showeth him. Moreover, if thou know not the mercy that God hath showed thee in Christ, thou canst not know him as a Father." Thou mayest well, apart from Christ, know him as a tyrant, and thou mayest know him by his works as the old philosophers did, that there is a God, but thou canst neither believe in his mercy nor love his laws, which is the only worship in the Spirit, save by Christ, unquote. William Tyndale, Protestant reformer, knew the truth, And he also knew the lie, and he exposed the lie. He condemned the lie as just as much his responsibility as preaching the gospel. That's what is uniquely characteristic of all the Protestant reformers. They found denunciation of the papacy, the Antichrist of Scripture, to be equal with the preaching of Jesus Christ and his salvation. It's part of the gospel. Imagine the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, the one that we should read and memorize and hold dear and keep as precious, begins by the words, Here is the revelation of Jesus Christ. But guess what it talks about mostly? Yes, it makes reference to Jesus often. But that book in its entirety is more about Antichrist than it is about Jesus Christ. That's how much our Savior wants us to know who his counterfeit is, who the deceiver is, who has taken over the churches. It's not in the progress. It is a done deal. And the worst place for a man of God who seeks to know the truth, the worst place for one seeking the truth, is in the churches today. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Judgment, plagues are coming upon this Roman Catholic Church and upon all her, of her ecumenical evangelical daughters who are in the same business, whoring after the Pope. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. 
And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total lost.